Now, one of the things that I was talking to, I was talking to an atheist on Twitter about two or three years ago, and this is the experience that happened to me, and I think it's actually worth thinking about. I said to the person, honest to God, they acted like I said something in Chinese from another planet. I offered as a casual aside, said that there is skill involved in spiritual experiences. And literally, the atheist that I was talking to, honest to God, acted like I said something in Chinese, beamed in from another planet. Skill. Honestly, a lot of, this is something that a lot of atheists can learn from because you pride yourself on rational understanding and reason, reason, reason and rationality. But when it comes to religious experience, it's like you, you automatically turn a switch off so you interpret these things in as dumb possible ways as humanly possible. Never occurred to her, never occurred to this person that that could even be remotely true, even though it is true. And then she started taking issue with me as if I didn't know what I was talking about. So, let's be clear. What do I mean? Practicing religious experiences. Now, when I have brought this up in the past and I'll bring this up in the future, science is on my side and starting to clearly understand this. There is a field of research that is very new, but in its infancy, but getting somewhere quickly called neurotheology. Okay, and what they have discovered, this isn't me, Craig Reed, talking, I know this because Jesus revealed to my heart, hallelujah. What they have discovered in these studies they have done backs up what I told this person, what I knew from personal experience. There are, you can be better at spiritual experiences, you can be better at praying, you can be better at things that produce spiritual experiences and getting results from them. It's, there is skill involved in this. One person can be really, really much better at it than another person. It's just like anything else in life. It's just like anything else in life. Why is that important? Because you can also be part of a church environment, which a lot of you were if you were former fundamentalists, who don't know what they're doing. That's not a new tr true Scotsman fallacy. If I were hanging out with those church, that particular church group, I bet you 99 times out of 100, I'd be like, these guys don't know anything. These guys don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. This is just reality. Religious experience is like any other thing. You can be good at it, you can be bad at it, there's a skill involved and you can learn how to increase at it. Even as my church today, even at my church today, there are a lot of people who go to my church who say they don't know how to pray and they don't know how to hear from God and they don't know what they're doing when they pray and they wish they could be better at it. There's a skill involved. There's a skill involved. It's very similar to exercise. Why did I bring up neurotheology? Because neurotheology is starting to understand this. It is mapping out the brain chemistry of spiritual experiences. And one of the things they are finding is that when you participate in spiritual experiences regularly, you can get better at them and they, change, they alter your brain chemistry. And the more you go into that particular experience, the more the more you alter your brain chemistry, it's kind of like you build a groove for yourself, you develop a muscle. You develop instincts and intuitions on how to participate in that experience more fully each time. So you get better at it internally, chemistry-wise. By the way, they've done the same study with math students and, and like, um, for like physicists and people like that. If you, you the, the layperson and me the layperson are struggling with a co complex mathematical problem, okay? It uses up a whole chunk of our brain and it's really, really hard for us to do and re requires like enormous muscles that we haven't used. When a mathematician is struggling with a complex problem, he's using a lot less energy, a lot less of his brain power. You get better at it. That's the point. It's a skill like anything else. The closest analogy I can think of is to exercise. It's a very similar principle. If you right now are a couch potato and I told you, do 15 minutes of exercise tomorrow and you're out of shape. You won't be able to do it. You'll be wheezing in five minutes. And then as you participate in exercise, I knew this really well once because there was a time, I'm okay now, I jog about two hours or an hour and a half every other day or something like that. That's not very good, but it's not terrible. Um, back when I was in, there was a period of time when I was in high school, I used to walk everywhere and I was on a couple of teams and I was like playing hockey sack with friends in school all the time. I was in killer shape killer shape. I was felt like physically awesome all the time. And I remember that because there are times when I've gotten close to that 
uh, since then. And what happens with exercise? If you try to get in shape, this is exactly how it goes down. You know exactly what I'm telling you. God's honest truth. You, you, the first time you exercise, if you have it in a while, it's a struggle. Then if you, if you start developing a rhythm, a ritual, you get up a certain time every day or you go 5 o'clock, you go to the gym and you do aerobics for 25, 30 minutes. It gets easier to do, A, and you start to really enjoy it, B, and you get much better at getting the beneficial results. Prayer works the exact same way. So when I report to you that I disappear in my prayer class and literally within three minutes I feel almost complete peace of mind within three minutes, I'm telling you the God's honest truth and the stats and the, the scientific, the, if you put me up to the machines, they back that up. I'm telling you the God's honest truth and it could be easily backed up by hooking me up to machines. They, they show that I've slowed down my breathing, I've slowed down my brain, I've, I've, I've probably lowered my blood pressure. So when I say I disappear in my prayer closet within three minutes, I feel powerfully connected to something transcendent and I feel almost total peace of mind. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. And if you put me up to a machine right then, the machine would say, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's telling the truth. We measured it. So, so far, nobody doubts this, right? We're all dealing with established fact here. Now, the, the smart atheist, the person who's not the dense atheist, is going to say, well, what we're actually, nobody doubts that you have exper spiritual experience, and probably nobody doubts that you derive great benefit from them, at least subjectively. What we're doubting is what produces it. You say it's God, you say it's God, Jesus freak, and we say it's just your brain chemistry. You say, yeah, you call me a name. Well, I do that because that's how you roll. You call me a name. You say it's God, Jesus freak, and we say it's your brain chemistry and that alone. Okay, now, here's where this is going to start to get really interesting because I'm relatively certain without a whole bunch of fanfare and melodrama that I can prove that it isn't just internal to me. I can actually literally prove that there is something external to me. Didn't say I can prove it's Jesus Christ, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, but I'm pretty sure that I can prove that it's something external to me that doesn't seem like that tall of an order. Prove. Did I stutter over the word proof? No, I actually didn't, did I? Prove. Doesn't think it would be, doesn't seem to me like that's that tall of an order. And if I can prove that it's something external to me, you know, that's the whole ballgame as far as I'm concerned. So, maybe not in this particular video, but, you know, like I say all the time, this isn't the only video I'm going to make in the summer. Yeah, I know, you talk a lot, right? I know I do. I know I do. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, you really do. Um, all right, so let's take, this, let's take the church that I brought us to upon occasion in some of my other videos. Sunday morning, I go into a church, correct? Everyone's with me so far. The same thing happened every single Sunday, no exceptions. The music starts playing, okay, and everybody starts kind of worshiping. Within about three minutes, there is a time in the worship. Now, this is not proof right here, but this is if you're an atheist playing along at home, pay attention to this because this is really interesting. And I promise you it's true. Promise you it's true. There is a time right in the first five minutes of the first worship song where all of a sudden the atmosphere shifts. When I, the Christian community, we in the Christian community say the anointing descends. <gasps> Hallelujah, the anointing has descended. That's what Benny Hinn will say. Hallelujah, Jesus. The anointing has come. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what he does. Um, so there's a time where something shifts in the atmosphere there, and all of a sudden the entire congregation, bar a few people, excepting a few people, are seem to be worshiping completely in unison, I promise. And here's what's interesting about the experience, okay? It happens automatically. If you ask the, the Christians what happened there, they'd say that's the time where the anointing came into the room. That's the time where the anointing descended. Now, I get that you don't believe that there's anointing Holy Spirit, things like that. But if I put you, even the most skeptical skeptic that ever skeptic, I don't care which one of you is listening. You could be Aaron Ra's, you know, evil twin. <laughs> As I said before, he's probably the evil twin. He is the evil twin. Okay, Aaron Ra's far more skeptical older brother. I don't care who you are. You could be the most skeptical skeptic that ever skeptic this green earth. And if I put you smack dab in the middle of that experience... There's a couple things you notice. First of all, everyone's behavior changes in unison. You'd see it with your own eyes. Why is that important, Craig? Everybody's behavior, repeat, think about that. Think about why that's important. Everybody's behavior changes in unison, automatically. How is that possible? Internal delusion. It's a delusion, Craig. If it were a delusion, how on earth are they all getting the cue to be deluded at the exact same time? 
The preacher doesn't give any any mess. He doesn't go ah, and just, it doesn't give a cue word. He doesn't hip, if he's if it's it's a if it's an act of hypnosis. First of all, it'd be the greatest mass hypnotist that ever lived, and he's just an average Joe preacher. He'd be doing a lot more than just trying to convince us that the Bible, <laughs> trying to convince us that God is real. He'd be doing a lot more and be a lot more successful if he was that good of a mass hypnotist that he could hypnotize you know two hundred and fifty people that successfully that quickly. But here's the important part: he doesn't give any cue word. There's nothing that he says that we all go, oh, let's all pretend that we believe God is here. We, we're not all pretending in unison. What's cueing us? Think about it. It's a more interesting question than you realize. Think about it. Really think about it. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to go in, that into it now. I'll, again, I'll come back to the subject and, again. But I want you to think about that. Because that's step one and why I'm convinced that I can pretty much prove that it isn't solely internal brain chemistry. And say I'm going to prove to you that it's Jesus Christ. But I'm pretty sure that I can prove, prove, literally prove that it is something external. Step one, reconsider what I just said. There is a moment and the moment happens every single time I go to church in the first minute, the first worship song. Somewhere in the first two minutes of the first worship song, it happens Every single time, there's never any difference. There becomes a period that the Christian would say, that's when the anointing descended. And everybody's behavior changes. If I put you in that experience, an atheist, you'd see the difference in their behavior with your own eyes. You'd see the difference in the behavior with your own eyes. If that were something solely internal, how did everybody get cued in at the exact same time? That's the question. That's the question. And if you're one of these smarty boots like, you know, quick, prove them wrong, atheist, answer that question. Answer that question in any way that's plausible because I can't think of any plausible explanation for that. And I doubt you'll be able to think of one either. If you've got a plausible explanation, I'm willing to listen. But if you're, if you're an open-minded atheist, really think that through because that's a really interesting question, isn't it? How on earth does everybody get cued in to shift their behavior at the exact same time if there's not something external happening. Now, I didn't say I proved anything yet. Did I? No. I didn't. But, again, ask yourself that question. If that phenomena goes down exactly the way I just told you it did, and it does, if I'm telling the truth, if I go to my church service and every Sunday the worship music starts and within a minute and a half people's behavior automatically changes, Somewhere in there, it's as if something has descended upon us. That's what it actually is experienced like. That's part of the reason why I'm so completely convinced that God is real. Because that experience is 100% real to me, I promise. And I literally experience that as something descending upon us. An anointing descending upon us. I subjectively experience that that way. I don't experience that as, oh, quick, he said that. Let's all pretend we all believe in God now. And I don't see any way, any other way to account for that experience. And I didn't say, you know, if you're going to be a street epistemologist about it, you're going to say, well, there's somebody in India somewhere who's having a different experience. That they it's not what I said. I'm talking about my specific experience right there. Street epistemologize that. Try to account for that experience as something other than an external cue. Because I can't imagine how, how, how everybody's behavior can change at the exact same time on, as if on cue if they aren't actually experiencing something outside of them, themselves. There may be a good answer. I didn't say I proved anything. I'm just saying. Think about it. If there's a good answer, let's hear it. Because I can't think of any other reason. And with that, you know, again, I'll come back to this. I think that's the beginning stages of how I'm going to prove that it's not just me and my pretty little head. It's not just my little imaginings and my little vivid imagination. I have a pretty vivid imagination. I'll give you that. I'll grant you that. <laughs> it's big of you, Greg. Yeah, I'll seed you that. I have a pretty vivid imagination. But I can't for the life of me think how you could possibly account for a shift in behavior that takes place in literally 200 people. How can you account for that? Mass delusions. Mass delusions has to have some sort of external cue, do they not? How the, how's the guy cue us that we all mass delude that, the Holy Spirit at the exact same time? We all, if we're pretending, this is what we do. We all pretend at the exact same time that something has entered the room. How are we doing that? We're not checking each other. We're not looking around. 
Oh, he's pretending that, that the Holy Spirit, let's, now let me pretend. That may have been how it went down in your church when you were fundamentalist. You might have looked around and, and got accused external from the behavior of your friends and said, oh, cool, cool, let me pretend. I've seen that happen too. Actually, <laughs> yeah, to be perfectly honest, I have. <laughs> I have. I've seen people all, you know, really, really primed to think this prophet was the greatest prophet ever and start falling all over themselves to kind of pretend that she was being a hundred times more groundbreaking than she was. I swear, I've seen that. This isn't that. I'll go into that in another video. I shouldn't, I shouldn't even brought it up because now I just, I just gave all the atheists an excuse. See, see, blah, 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 it's fake. I knew it's fake. Blah, blah, blah. He just admitted, I don't know. I probably gave an excuse to stay. Gave you an excuse to stay an atheist. Yeah, I gave, you, I gave you more time. Gave you a little more time to be an atheist. But you want to actually understand spiritual phenomenon, deal with it honestly. Deal with it honestly. How on earth could a, a phenomenon that's solely internal be shared by 250 people at the exact same time without an external cue. Say, oh, quick, you know, pretend, you pretend. Now's the time where we got to start pretending we all believe that this is God. How does that work exactly? I can't think of any way that that could possibly be just strictly someone's internal mechanisms, just their brain chemistry. Why? Because other people are doing it at the exact same time. How'd I, how'd I cue them? How'd I cue them? If it's just me and my brain chemistry, yeah, I understand. If I go into my prayer closet, you can say, yeah, it's just you and your brain chemistry. Fine. Whatever. Don't think you're right there either, but I can understand it there. But how am I cueing other people to have the experience at the exact same time? It's more interesting question than you realize. It's more interesting question than you realize because from that question is going to be how I'm going to prove. Prove. Literally prove. Yeah, literally prove, I think. That something is happening that is transcended in nature, external to us. Really think I'm going to prove that. I don't think it's going to be all that challenging. So, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.